I thought I'd share a few pictures of where Jill and I were while we were gone. This is in San Juan. We got together with Bill and Sharon, who are online with us right now at the Cocoa Beach campus. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Sharon. We're also in the middle. There are Andrew and Debbie, friends of ours, and then Jill and I are there at the, on the right-hand side. We just had a wonderful time being together, and I'm supposed to look here and say good morning to some of those others who are online. Good morning, Brianne. Good morning also to the North Carolina campus. Good morning, John. Good morning, Kirsten. Good morning. Good morning to also David and Leticia down in Louisiana. Good morning, Steve, and good morning, Sarah, and others of you that are online, and Jill, who was here a few moments ago, but is now with one of our shut-ins. She was the one asking, give me the thumbs up. She was feeling led of the Spirit just to go and continue the service with one of our shut-ins who couldn't be at the service, but is online with us sharing these moments together. And Jill and Judy are right together right now. So they're on together watching and sharing these moments with us. Well, my doctor gave me permission four weeks after dying of cardiac arrest <laughs> to go scuba diving because I said I'm pushing myself, walking one to two miles every day and at weights and just trying to push, push, push. He said, I'm going to tell you you can because it's motivating you to be healthy and go for it. So we just had a wonderful time. This is St. Kitts that Jen and I were talking about before service. This is one of the wrecks in St. Kitts, and we went down on this wreck diving together and, and met this little character, the largest barracuda I have ever met. Face to face, he was over four feet long. He was a good, and he's showing his teeth to tell me, you're not coming in any further. <laughs> we agreed to just mind each other's business. Right outside the wreck, a beautiful stingray came out of the dust and able to capture a picture. Then this is my lovely bride. She was going to do the Titanic scene at the, at the bow of the ship, and she was waiting for me to come around, and she didn't realize I was behind her taking a picture. Here's Bill and Sharon on top of the wreck, and down below we met this cute little guy. This is an unusual honeycombed, large spiked puffer fish. Very unusual. I think it might be the first we've seen. See a lot of puffers, but this, with this honeycomb one was unusual. And then we met this character. He was one of six that started coming and surrounding us. And of course they start far off in the distance and they zoom in closer and then they start coming right at you and start saying, you're in our territory now. But then right before they hit you, they veer off, a nice little black-tipped reef shark. And sometimes they get so close, I couldn't fit them into the frame of the camera because they were right in front. So, wonderful time. Diving, some people say, Pastor, are you insane? Are you crazy? You're diving with sharks? You know, some people might think it's crazy. But there are sharks and there are sharks. Black tip reef sharks, not a problem. Nurse sharks, not a problem. I won't dive with great white sharks because they eat you. <laughs> okay? And you have to know in life what things are safe and what things are not safe what things are cool and wise, and what things are really stupid. And if you know that difference, you can make your way through life so much easier. But if you don't know the difference, then you start getting yourself into trouble. We're going to talk about the church at Pergamos and how some of those could not recognize the difference and got themselves into all kinds of trouble. Revelation Chapter number two is where we're going to go to. But first, I want you to take your Bible in your hand as we continue our journey. And 
declare this loudly with me. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living Word. You may be seated. Open up to Revelation number 2. i got to tell you about this little boy. He's at the grocery store with his mom, and he's just kind of hanging outside when this stranger comes up to him and says, excuse me, son, can you tell me where the post office is? And, and the, the boy says, well, you go down this street three blocks, you turn right, take the first left, it's about 50 feet in front of you. He said, oh, thank you so much. He says, I'm new in town. I'm the new pastor at church over here. I'd love for you to come to church. I can tell you how to get to heaven. Little boy looks at him. I don't know. You're going to try to tell me how to get to heaven, and you don't even know how to get to the post office? <laughs> <laughs> Revelation chapter 2, our third church, starting at verse number 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and with, will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who's received it. Wow, this is incredible. Let's take the trip together to Pergamos. Now, this is flattened out picture so we can see in correlation to where the United States is. If we go east to Africa and Europe, to the Mediterranean Sea, there in the land that is now the country of Turkey, western Turkey, was the area known under the Roman Empire as the province of Asia or Asia Minor. There we have the seven churches. This is part number two of Revelation. Jesus told John to write the things which he had seen, which was there in chapter one, the things which are, which is chapters two and three, and the things which are yet to come, which is chapters four through 22. Here, these seven churches, uh, they are making up what really is a postal route, and Jesus is sending letters to these seven churches on this postal route from Ephesus north to Smyrna north to Pergamos then south to Thyatira Sardis Philadelphia and Laodicea we've already looked at Ephesus we've already visited Smyrna now we're on church number three and if you missed any of the earlier messages they are available for you on our YouTube channel Family Worship Center Door County and you will find them waiting for you welcome to the church in the land of the city of Pergamos. Now, I need to help you understand what Pergamos was like. 65 miles north of Smyrna, 25 miles inland. Pergamos was different. You see, it was not a port city. 
Not like Ephesus, not like Smyrna, where they had all kinds of shipping and commerce going back and forth. No, Pergamos was not like that. It was built completely around an 1,100 foot mountain on the plain that for hundreds of years had been the place that was sacred for idol worship. The entire city of Pergamos was built for and on idol worship. Now Ephesus and Smyrna had idol worship added into their culture, but Pergamos was built on that idol worship. It was at the crossroads of the north there. It was on this major crossroads, which made it also easy access. And that was important because it was the capital of Asia Minor, and it was the cultural center of Asia Minor. The second largest library in the world at that time, 200 thousand volumes was there in Pergamos, second only to Alexandria, Egypt. And when Mark Anthony wanted to give a gift to Cleopatra, he took much of that library and gave it to her for Alexandria, making it the greatest library ever. Primarily, Pergamos had one purpose, idol worship. It was the destination for idol worship. Almost every Roman deity had a temple there in Pergamos. On the Acropolis, that means the the top of the mountain area, there was a huge throne-like altar carved out with the inscription, Zeus Soter, meaning Zeus is the Savior. If you needed power, yep. Pray with almighty Zeus, king of kings, he was called. He was there. Oh, but if you needed something else, well, suppose you sought pleasure. The temple of Dionysus was there where they had drunken orgies. If you wanted good crops, you would go to the temple of Dimeter. If you were searching for wisdom, you go to the temple of Athena. You see, temple after temple was there in 29 A.D., Pergamos became the center of emperor worship in the whole province of Asia Minor because they built the temple to Augustus Caesar and to the goddess Roma. Yeah, Pergamos was all about idol worship and the number one principal god of Pergamos was this guy, Asclepius, the god of healing. Now you've seen his symbol pretty much everywhere in the world, you see the symbol which is like the three intersected lines with the serpent crawling around a pole. That's the international symbol for medical relief, medical help. You'll see that on a lot of ambulances. You'll see that around the world as the international symbol for medical help. You notice the coinage there from Pergamos. You see a serpent on one side, multiple serpents on the other side, and you see Asculapius in a carved statue there where he is holding the rod with the serpent crawling up. Why? Well, because he was the god of healing. And this was where So many people from the whole Roman Empire, if you needed healing, you would go to the temple of Asclepius. They'd make this long journey to go there, and when they got there, they would be put into a trance, and they would lay on the floor in the temple. They would leave them there overnight, and they would release snakes. And the snakes would come and crawl all over these people that were in a trance laying in the temple. And they were supposed to give them a vision of what was wrong. And then they would tell the doctors, and the doctors would prescribe to them for what the demonic, saint, the demonic snakes had told them was their illness. Anybody interested in? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because that brings us back to Genesis chapter 3, doesn't it? When Satan wanted to appear and tempt the humans, what did he do to Adam and Eve? He brought the the snake. And you see the serpent 
and the snake, and you say, wow, this, it's like Satan being there. Uh-huh, yeah. Now, Asclepius, hmm, he was that principal God, but the Christians came and began to preach Jesus. They began to say, you don't need to go to a school of Pius for healing because Jesus went to the cross. He died in your place, paid for your sin and your sickness. And they prayed for people and people got healed. They said, you don't need to go to the temple of Athena to pray for wisdom. All you have to do is ask Jesus as Jesus' half-brother James, who wrote the epistle, said, you know, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who is joyfully ready to give you all the wisdom you need. If you needed blessings on your crops or your business, you don't have to go to the temple of diamond, or you just have to go to the one who said, you just put me first in your life, I'm going to pour out blessings on everything you have. Yeah, and you didn't need to go to the drunken orgies and the garbage that was all around. Jesus would give fulfillment through his Holy Spirit that would be so powerful and satisfying and joyful, you don't need any of that. Well, of course, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ was totally saying all of these temples are worthless. All of everything that Pergamos is built on is of no value. Everything that you need, Jesus provided for you at the cross. So the Christians were considered divisive. They were dangerous to the community. Because Jesus, Jesus brought the answer for everything. And not only did he die, but he rose again from the dead. So the gospel in Pergamos, a lot of people got saved but boy, the persecution got intense. And you look at verse number 12. Look at verse number 12. Once again, to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. Now all of the emphasis of that verse is on the sword. That's what the emphasis is. In fact, in the Greek it uses three articles to describe the sword. It says the sword, the two-edged the sharp. Why does Jesus show himself with the sharp two-edged sword to Pergamos? Because every single letter Jesus is personalizing to the culture, to the community, to the needs. Just like he is personalizing things in your life to the needs of your life. You see, this emphasis is not an accident. Jesus is saying, the, he has the sharp two-edged, the sword, in complete confutation. That means contradiction and replacement and ultimate authority over it all, over the Roman emblem of imperial power. Jesus replaced all of it. So, you need to understand the context a little more to understand what he's saying the provincial governor because Pergamus was the capital the provincial governor was granted what is called Eus Gladi and you know Gladi from gladiator the gladiators that went into the games and fought with swords well Eus Gladi means the right of the sword and the provincial governor had the right of the sword what does that mean he had the right of the sword to take and execute anyone he wanted. If you were a Roman citizen, he would slice your head off because that was merciful. <laughs> but if you weren't a Roman citizen, Eus Gladi meant they could take you and they could pierce you as many times as they wanted to make you bleed and stick you like a pig, as the expression goes, to make you suffer and bleed and die. Now, when they were doing the execution, they would lead the person 
to be executed through the streets, just like Jesus was led through the streets on his way out to be crucified. They would lead the person through the streets, and in front of them, they had a giant sword that was held up, ominously displayed, saying, Fear this! Fear this! Because as provincial governor, you get out of line. You threaten our temples, I will kill you. So how do you respond to that? Well, Jesus says, they don't have the real sword. I have the real sword. I want you to go to Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter number 12. This is so incredibly important. Because Jesus wants you and he wants every believer to think with an eternal mindset. I told my physician when I was there, and, and he was surprised I had come back from cardiac arrest. I told him, it's so, I'm not afraid to die. A lot of people, they go through that, and depression hits them really heavy. I said, I'm not afraid to die. I already know I'm going to heaven. You see, to threaten a Christian with death is, wait a minute, you're threatening to send me to heaven? <laughs> right? That's what Jesus wants you to think like. He wants you to see that this life that you now live in the flesh, it's only temporary. And when people try to threaten you with Eos Gladi, with the sword, they're trying to threaten you and say, we can take you out. Say, <laughs> you're threatening me with heaven? <laughs> You realize how ridiculous that is? That's the mindset Jesus wants in here in Luke chapter number 12, starting at verse 4. He says, and I say to you, to who? My friends. You see that? I say to you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. And that was a word that Jesus was giving to those believers. You don't have to be afraid of the ears gladi. All they can do is send you to heaven. <laughs> That's the worst they can do to you. You need to fear God because Jesus holds the true sword. Go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 4, and you see a little bit more about that true sword. In Hebrews chapter number 4, it's described for us. We see in chapter number 1, of course, Jesus is the one who's holding that two-edged sword that's coming out of his mouth. His words are the two-edged sword that can cut. And here in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12, the scripture says, For the word of God, what Jesus speaks, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Wow. And it does, doesn't it? Sometimes someone will be sharing a scripture, maybe you're just reading a verse or doing, and it's like, ooh, it's like a sword that just cuts right into where you really need God to speak into your life. The sword, the word of God speaks into your life and it gives discernment and under, wow, I understand now. I can see it clearly now. It gives you the mind of Christ. So Jesus says, don't be afraid of their sword. Their sword can only send you to heaven. The one we really need to fear is God and make sure our lives are right with him. Now Jesus declares here, he says, I know. He says that in all seven letters. He tells each one of the churches, I know. 
And that word means he knows from personal experience being there and observing it. And what does that tell you right now? Jesus is here. He's with us. He's here with us. And he knows what's going on in each one of our lives. He's aware of the challenges that you're facing, the stresses that weigh you down, the temptations that are coming on you. He's aware of how you feel. And as it so beautifully says in Hebrews, we do not have a high priest who is not touched by the feelings of our infirmity. Double negative in the Greek means big emphasis. He is touched by the feelings of what you're going through. Not not just the situation. Your feelings matter to God. How you feel matters to God. You might think, hey, there's seven billion people. He's God. He's God. And he knows what you're going through. He says, I know. And I care about you including the very feelings of your infirmity, the hurt, the heartache, the pain, where no one else saw you crying. Jesus did. Where no one else saw you swallowing that pain, Jesus saw every bit of it. He just wants to hold you. And he wants to say, I love you. I am with you. I know what's going on in your life. When he speaks this to the, the church at Pergamos, he says, I know. And he lists five things that he is fully aware of. Three of these are positive affirmations. Two of them are location facts. Location. He says, you in Pergamos... You are living where Satan lives. That is the throne of Satan. He says, and you are, you're living there right in the dwelling place of the devil. Whew. That's pretty intense, isn't it? That church was in the place where Satan himself was dwelling. Now you might say, take a look at some scripture here. We're going to pull up Ephesians. Remember, Ephesus is only a hundred miles to the south. Ephesus is one of the provincial cities over which the proconsul there in Pergamos oversees. Ephesians chapter number six. And the Apostle Paul tells us about the spiritual battles that you and I are encountering within our lives he says in verse, I'm going to start in verse number 11. No, take it to verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So often we think that we're just dealing with flesh and blood, human being problems. No, no, it's deeper than that. There are spiritual forces at work you're not wrestling on flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, wickedness. But you need to know this. You put on that whole armor of God. You be strong in the Lord and know that greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You don't have to be afraid of the devil. I got news for you. The devil is potty his pants scared of you. Why is the devil so scared of you? Because you have the authority of God. Why does he attack you? Because he's like a bully trying to make it look like he's big and tough. But he knows you're the one that has the real authority. In Daniel chapter number 10, we see Daniel, he's been praying for months and the angel comes as and the archangel Michael says, I'd have been here sooner. 
from the very first day that you prayed, God heard your prayers, sent me to bring you an answer. But the prince of the power of the air over Persia withstood me, and there was a battle in the heavenly realm. And we, he says, Michael came, helped. We had angels fighting in this spirit realm. And now I was able to bring you the answer. There are spiritual forces at work, and they use locations. There is over the city here, over the county here, there are demonic forces. Should you be worried about them? <laughs> They're worried about you. They're scared of you. If you know who you are in Jesus and you walk in the power of God and in the might of God, they stand nothing against you. Isaiah chapter 14 talks about how, I don't have time for it, because I have four and a half minutes left, and I told myself today, self, you're not going to go overtime today, all right? <laughs> so I cut the message in half, and i now cutting this half into half, <laughs> so we can, we'll just continue next week, Right? In Isaiah chapter 14, you read that and you realize why Satan made Pergamos his dwelling place with the Asclepius, the serpents there, the worship, all idol worship that was there. Satan was right at home. But this church didn't have to be afraid. People like to skip and go to the, I have a few things against you, Jesus says. They like to skip to that point. But remember in Ephesus, where some people call it the church that lost its first love? And they, put all, they skip right to that, and they forget the ten things that Jesus said this church was so awesome and incredible for. Well, if, if you skip over the, to the few things against you, you're also going to miss some big stuff here in Pergamos and not recognize how Jesus compliments this church. He says, I know your works. Man, he means I've seen it. I was right there. I watched an erga. The word for works means the accomplishments of your outward actions that have been carried out from your inner desires. He's saying, I know your hearts. Oh, I know your hearts. You want to do the things of God. You want to see God work in your life. And the outward actions that you have accomplished have shown who you really are and how you love me. Jesus said, I, I saw what you did. You're, you're doing great. He says, I know your works. And he says, and that you hold fast to my name. Now this, this is so big. This is huge. Because the word here for hold fast comes from Christ and it means mastery and strength. This church at Pergamos, they were like masters at serving Jesus. And they were strong, holding strong to his name. In fact, you remember in the first chapter where Jesus appears to John and he, in his right hand there are seven stars. And Jesus says, these are the seven churches. And he's holding them in his right hand, his hand of power. This is the same Greek word. In other words, this church at Pergamos was holding on to Jesus' name in the same way he was holding on to them. Dude, that's cool. Wow, what a faithful church they are. And that's exemplified by the third thing he says. You did not deny my faith. In the midst of incredible persecution, in the, the threat of Eus Gladi, even with Antipas being killed, they did not give up. This is not the church that compromised. That's what a lot of people label it. Does these three things that Jesus said sound like they're a compromising church? Sounds like they're a powerful church. Well, then why do they have some things there that were bad? We'll talk about that next week. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that next week. Because I'm, I'm totally, like, out of time. So, and I don't have time for that. So, how do I close this out?
You guys are awesome. You're an awesome church. I love being here with you. I love it. I love it. On my way to church this morning, I was so excited and so happy. I get to be at church with you guys. We are family, aren't we? We say that all the time, don't we? You are loved. You belong. You're family. We're an eternal family. Now, all of us have earthly families as well that we love. We do. On Wednesday, my little brother who shared a bedroom with him for a decade plus, love him dearly. He took his gun and he shot himself. He struggled with things. And fear, fear gripped his life and he didn't think he could go on. You need to know that Jesus is bigger than anything you face. He has the power to get you through anything you face, but you gotta turn to him. And you cannot let the things in this world control you. And we're gonna talk about that next week. But you need to make sure in the battles that you face, you call out to Jesus because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And if you will turn to the Lord, he will be your help, a very present help in time of trouble, if, but that, that two-letter word, if, if, God leaves it up to you to make the choice. He's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to force you to serve him. He's not going to force you to follow him, you have to choose. Please, I beg you, I beg you, dear ones, follow him. You need Jesus to be number one in your life. Hard times come to all of us. We all face challenges. We all face struggles. But if you will put the Lord first, you need to know that the Jesus at Pergamos with the two-edged sword whooped the snot out of everything that those temples all stood for. Jesus is everything that you need if, if you will turn your heart to him completely. Will you do that? Stand with me, please, dear ones. So many of you have been in prayer for me, and I appreciate it. I have been overwhelmed by the kindness that has been poured out. Thank you. The greatest thing you can do for me is live your life for Jesus without compromise. Live your life for him. Turn to him. Make him everything. Make him number one in your life. Because if Jesus is your number one, it doesn't matter what comes, you're going to get through. Will you pray right out loud? Even Lift up your hands like you're saying, I surrender, and pray right out loud and say, Dear Jesus, you are everything. You're everything I need. And you've done everything for me. You sacrificed yourself, died on the cross, paid for my sins, took my place so I could have eternal life. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me for my past. And I thank you right here and now that I am completely forgiven because of your precious blood. My sins are washed away. And my life belongs to you. 
I surrender to you, Jesus. Everything I am, everything I have, I am yours. My life is yours. Have your way. And remind me, Lord Jesus, no matter what I face, you are more than enough. You are more than enough. You are my Savior. And I am your child. In Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, dear ones, I'm going to continue this, and I might even get through the next third. We'll find out. I want to encourage you, be faithful, be faithful, be faithful. And please know I love you and thank you for praying. God bless you. You are dismissed. And those of you online, please remember this Thursday night we're having the small group again. And the questions are in today's outline and the discussion items and questions for home and small group. I look forward to seeing you online Thursday night. Love you guys. (laughs) 